So we notice something about the difference between the two flutes. You have the fine instrument, and you have Da Chen's uh, flute. <laughs> <laughs> what he can do with that is he can swell the sound. He can make it bigger. The dynamics in his instrument are what we have in our voices. And today's workshop really is as much about exploring the dynamic of the voice and the dynamic of attitude as well as the actual words on the page. We're talking about slam. Slam poetry, if there is such a thing, is a really the presentation of one's own written original work with an audience where a few people have been chosen at random to act as judges and to give scores. It's a joke. The idea, it's like teachers grading our papers. It's, hello? <laughs> so that's the fun of it. And it was invented in Chicago uh, by a man named Mark Smith who went to the local bar. He was a construction worker and nobody would come to his poetry readings. You know, poetry readings where people sit on their hands and as if they're in church. Uh, and he went to the manager of the Green Mill and said, you're a little slow here on Monday nights. How about we have poetry competition and we'll give it a name for hype. We'll call it slam. And his goal was to try to interest his fellow construction workers in attending poetry readings. The poet has three minutes on stage, no more. That really adds to the experience for the audience because they're not listening to one voice over and over. But it's also the experience for the writer because the audience knowing that they have only going to have this person for three minutes or less are especially attentive. And so the writer has really the gift of an audience that's truly listening. So that's why I like SLAM. And after years and years of writing and publishing in small press magazines, never knowing if anybody had ever read anything that I'd written, I learned of SLAM, an opportunity to get direct feedback from the expressions of people in the audience whether my poem is actually making any sense at all. So that's it. I write as fast as I possibly can. I have my own form of shorthand. I encourage you to develop that so that you can write faster than you can think. The reason for this is because we want to suspend the critical mind and try to find language that surprises us. So you go anywhere you want to because it's yours. And there's no reason to assume that you know where you're going until after a certain period of time is over. Then you back away from it, wait three or four weeks, go back into your notebook, find that piece, and you will see it as a stranger if you have not reread it as soon as you wrote it. That takes a certain amount of discipline. But if you think you've written a masterpiece and you immediately reread it, you freeze it in your mind. You can't approach it as the critical stranger that is your potential audience. So I want to have us do that kind of quick writing. And I run this as a race to see who can write the most, not the best in seven minutes time. And because it's a race, we all start with our pencils way up in the air. <laughs> no bad elbows, that would give you a head start. <laughs> There's no way to do it wrong. 
If you don't like the words I give you as a writing prompt, if you don't like them, forget it. Write what you want to write. Everybody ready? Yeah. <laughs> the prompt. Flying above my childhood home. Oh, no. <laughs> Lady back there trying to get a head start. <laughs> Don't look around as if it's somebody else. It's you, sweetheart. <laughs> Flying above my childhood home. Get set. Prize goes to the longest piece, not the best. Spelling and neatness do not count. <laughs> right. Two, one, half a second, <laughs> quarter, eighth. <laughs> Sixteenth, thirty-second of a second, sixty-fourth, one-twenty-eighth, two-fifty-sixth. <laughs> Time's up. Good. Anybody have any luck with that? You know, your hand, you know, you get, you get your hand in shape if you do this every day. And what I love is that... Um, if you hold the pen a certain way, you begin to develop a writer's muscle. And I love to go to schools and ask kids to show me their writer's muscle. It's a way of making physical contact, which is without being threatening. Uh, <laughs> and the girls, you know, they'll hold out their writer's muscle this way, but the boys are often. <laughs> Let's try another one. Pencils up. Yeah. No way to do it wrong. Seven minutes. Perhaps it was the clams. <laughs> Get set. Right. Time's up. I want you to look over the longer of the two. This is violating the three-week rule. Admire your creativity, <coughs> the extraordinary results of only seven minutes. Uh, fiddle with it a little bit, you know, cross the T's, dot the I's, make sure it's legible to you, and make any small revisions you wish to. The longer of the two. Well, we've got to figure out who wrote the longest piece. I did say prize goes to the longest piece. I guess the best way to do that would be for each of us to read our longer piece aloud. <laughs> Lauren. Uh, we'll all do it at the same time. So we're going to make some cacophony. You know the sound of the orchestra warming up before? It is such wonderful music. And what happens is that it funnels down to just a few voices. And then maybe there's a duet. And sometimes you can actually follow what's happening in that duet. And then just one voice. If you are that one voice, do not back off. But actually pump it up. Because the rest of us will live the rest of our lives by your final words. <laughs>
So if everybody will stand with their peace in hand, Now, there's only one rule. And that is when you... <laughs> there's only one rule, and that is when you're done, you freeze. You don't allow your page to rattle. You certainly don't sit down. And you don't turn to the person next to you and say how weird that was. <laughs> Because we want to hear that funneling down of sound. And finally, uh, the winner, the person with the longest piece. <coughs> On the count of three. A one, a two, a one, two, three, hit it. I see the, about my childhood home. I see the starlings that troubled my father still in the mulberry, still stealing raspberries, even though the new owners have left the garden go to weeds. Above me only clouds, each with its own idea where next to float, and below those starlings and the new family. A barbecue. Dad with his apron at the fire pit, and Mom sloshed in a lawn chair. She's got a problem no one discusses that I would talk to her if only I could get an introduction. These are complicated times. I yell down and they look up. The starlings flutter, startled starlings and the little girls, potential starlings themselves, gather at their mother's feet. Pink insides glistening, flesh slimy and gleaming in the spilling light of the moon. By an angry body of water, where the waves won't even feel me enter, and the weepers weep briefly and return to their old frame houses. <laughs> What's your name? Johnny. Say again? Johnny. Johnny. And Emily, the runner-up, give it up for her too. Yeah. So that's kind of what I know. Um, <laughs> um, now we talk about the elements of, uh, of performance and the importance of eye contact which along with projection are the two things that I really believe make a difference in this world. So I'm going to ask you, again we'll do this in cacophony, and I'm going to ask you to risk taking your eyes off the page and looking uh, into mine, <laughs> or <laughs> into the person's next to you, or to turn around and give some eye contact to somebody in the back of the room. Flying above my childhood home, I see the starlings that troubled my father still in the mulberries. See how easy it is? It's just a matter of allowing yourself to slow down and lift and give the words from the page to your audience. On the count of three. A one, a two, a one, two, three, hit it. Flying above my childhood. I see the starlings that troubled my father still in the mulberries, still stealing raspberries, even though the new owners have let the garden go to weeds. Above me, only clouds, each with its own idea. Who next to float? And below, those starlings and the new family. Dad with his apron at the fire pit, and Mom with his apron standing in the lawn chair. She's got a problem no one discusses, though I would talk to her if only I could get an introduction. 
these are complicated times, I yelled down, and they look up. The starlings flutter, startled starlings, and the little girls, potential starlings themselves, gather at their mother's feet. All right, good. You all sit down. <laughs> Oshin shared the same fate as Diego, though he took a longer road. I wonder if Tiernan Oak is as wondrous as they say, or if Niv's breasts are as full and cream-colored as this broad I once rolled around with in Long Meadow, Massachusetts, while winter rain trickled down the gutter pipes keeping time with my thrust inside her. I think if Diego was alive today, if his heart hadn't exploded inside his chest in that leaf-cluttered lawn, he would light up a cigar for me and for the man himself and exhale, exhale ghosts of smoke into my face, laughing that hearty laugh, telling stories I've already heard and saying to me from his gut, that one line I've written was mighty grand. He was burned to ash in the fall. Oshin disintegrated in the legend. His ashes, who knows, might have been green. I long for an Ireland that never existed, an America that couldn't be. I long for a country where angels appear to guide and save, where fairies steal children, and you can identify them by their emerald eyes. Hmm. I believe in myths and verses. I believe in mermaids and Jesus Christ the Savior. I want to turn to dust like my father's after a long and compassionate life with eyes that have seen the guts of mental institutions and glorious kingdoms alike. I want to turn to dust scattered somewhere, hushed with snowfall, somewhere by an angry body of water where the waves won't even feel me enter and the weepers weep briefly and return to their old friend houses. Yeah. So when you, when you get a poem as heartfelt as that, it's really hard to offer critique because you don't want to mess with something that is so deeply felt. The one thing I'd want from you, Johnny, you've got that line, I think if Diego were alive today, am I getting that right? Mm -hmm. There's like four lines before that that you delivered so wonderfully, set the mood. And all I want you to do is to read the first eight lines of the poem. When you get to the part where I think if Diego were alive today, just before that, I want a pause, a really long pause, so that the words settle in and then that line comes in and hits us right here. And just do it, just so you're experiencing that pause. Go ahead. Oshin shared the same fate as Diego, though he took a longer road. I wonder if Tiernan Oak is as wondrous as they say, or if Neve's breasts are as full and cream colored as this broad I once rolled around with in Long Meadow, Massachusetts, while winter rain trickled down the gutter pipes, keeping time with my thrust inside her. I think if Diego was alive today, if his heart hadn't exploded inside his chest in that leaf cluttered lawn, he would light up a cigar for me and for the man himself and exhale ghosts of smoke into my face, laughing that hearty laugh, 
telling stories I've already heard and saying to me from his gut that one line I've written was mighty grand. He was burned to ash in the fall. Oshin disintegrated in the legend. His ashes, who knows, might be green. I long for an Ireland that never existed, an America that couldn't be. I long for a country where angels appear to guide and save, where fairies steal children and you can identify them by their emerald eyes. I believe in myths and verses. I believe in mermaids and Jesus Christ the Savior. I want to turn to dust like my father's after a long and compassionate life with eyes that have seen the guts of mental institutions and glorious kingdoms of life. I want to turn to dust scattered somewhere hush with snowfall, somewhere by an angry body of water where the waves won't even feel me enter and the weepers weep briefly and return to their old frame houses. You're a good man. Thank you. Yeah. 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 My pause was just right. Just right. You might even find another place in there where you could work in another, another pause. But, you know, that poem is like, ooh, it's a good one, Thank you know? You. Thank you, yeah. Who's next? John. You are. Yes, is that Nicole? Yeah. I don't recognize you with your hat on. <laughs> Give it up for Nicole. dwell in the sadness and I hear in those women that I should just cope with it and I hear in those men suck it up and fucking deal maybe it's wrong to think about it but it's better than this it is a plausible alternative instead of having withered away from cancer and chemo side effects dad could be in witness protection program hmm. it could have all been makeup it could have all been lighting it could have just been psychological manipulation counting on my sadness to block me from seeing the truth what if my grief is just a small sacrifice for your safety? Right now, he's riding in the back of a Sikorsky HH-60 Pavehawk rescue helicopter. He's instructing his team on this mission to save the final victim of a serial killer. By Dad's calculation, she has 47 minutes to live, and his plan will take 36 to execute. He'll comfort her while I cook dinner tonight. I do understand that we had an open casket at the funeral. I remember clearly tugging on my black sweater uh, that clung in all the wrong places. I remember as they said, I'm so sorry for your loss, that I heard, go ahead and try to fucking breathe. But it's the government, the secret part of it even. They can convince us of anything. I imagine them finally returning him to us, and I can't wait to be angry that his lies put me through that. Mm, nice job. <laughs> What strengths in that performance? Chris? Um, well, she made eye contact and she, it was, I don't know, the, she wasn't static. She had, there was energy there. Mm -hmm. Energy. Yeah. Am I the only one that wants her to stand still when she's <laughs> reading? <laughs> so she's going to do it again and this time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hold for her. And when you take a step, make it for real because it's coming from the poem, not from your nervousness, okay? okay? Yeah. You know, the whole thing is to fool yourself into believing that you can pull it off. That's, you know, what I heard an actor say on the radio a couple of years ago. He says, before I go on stage, every time I have to fool myself into believing that I can be the character that I'm supposed to play. Um, uh, can, can you Is this it? I'm sorry? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um, but it might be a little different because you told me it was okay to edit as I went. Sure. Okay. Um, if I'm being... I do think about it. I know I shouldn't let myself dwell on the sadness I hear, I hear those women say, just cope with it. And I hear those men say, just fucking up and deal. 
just whatever. <laughs> and <laughs> um, maybe it's wrong to think about it, but it's better than this. It is a plausible alternative. Dad might be a spy in the government that just went into witness protection. Instead of withering in a combination of cancer and chemo side effects, it was makeup and lighting, psychological manipulation, counting on my sadness to block me from seeing the truth. My grief is a small sacrifice for your safety. Right now, he's riding in the back of a Sikorsky HA-60 Pavehawk search and rescue helicopter. He's instructing his team on the mission to save the most recent victim by a serial killer. His, he's, his calculation says the girl will be alive for 47 minutes and his rescue plan will take about 36. He'll be comforting her while I cook dinner. I do understand that we had an open casket at the funeral. I remember clearly how I tugged at the black sweater that clung in all the wrong places. I remember well the, the well-meaning mourners saying I'm so sorry for your loss, which really sounded like go ahead and try to fucking breathe. It's the government though, the secret part of it even. They can convince us of anything. I imagine them finally returning him to us and I can't wait to be angry that he put us through this. Yeah, 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 you pulled it off. Thank you. So let's try an experiment. More cacophony. And this time I want you to whisper your poem. Whisper your poem. Remembering the eye contact. But, and trying to project even though it's a whisper. I don't know what it's going to sound like, but it might be entertaining. You might as well stand. On the count of three. A one. A two. A one, two, three. Hit it. Flying above my childhood home, I see the stars. Troubled my father, still in the mulberries, still stealing raspberries, even though the new owners have left the garden go to weeds. Above me, only clouds, each with its own idea, where next to float and go to weeds. Those starlings and the new family. A barbecue. Dad with his apron at the fire pit and mom sloshed in the lawn chair. She's got a problem no one discusses that I would talk to her if only someone would give me an introduction. These are complicated times. I yell down and they look up. The starlings flutter, startled starlings, and the little girls, potential starlings themselves, gather at their mother's feet. Emily, all right. <laughs> all right, down again. So what we're doing now is we're thinking about the different ways of vocalizing the words. Um, when I come to a four-letter word in a poem, I try to underplay it rather than yell it because it's foul enough itself that it doesn't need any exaggeration. Uh, when I come to a line that I think might be funny, used to be that I would raise my voice so everybody would get the joke. And uh, Roger Weingarten, do you know Roger, Baron? Roger said to me, I said, I don't know why nobody laughs at my joke. Perhaps tomorrow they will be cold enough to help. He said, Jeff, underplay it and it'll work. And it's true. So sometimes the impulse, you want to reverse the impulse just for experiment. So the next volunteer, we're going to ask eye contact as well as vocal <coughs> variety. 
Who is that person? Mm -hmm. You're on, please. And your name is? Dale. Dale? Dale. Please put your hands together for Dale. that day, that day of all days, and anyone knows that I loved him more than anybody. But you were talking and screaming and yelling, and I couldn't hear myself concentrate. And I guess I was trying to prove that I loved you two more than the dog. So I said, I'm not going to get us killed because you're messing around with that damn dog. That was hours before his eyes started drooping and brown stuff started streaming from his nose. And he didn't want to walk, so I had to push the baby, and you had to carry him home the whole way. And he was drooping off the couch. And I went upstairs, and he followed me up, gasping for breath. And when we went to the hospital, they kept him longer than they had to, just to prove that they had really done everything that they could. Hmm. And I waited until they said, I'm sorry, to scream. Yeah. Thanks. Garrett, what would you tell her? Uh, slow down. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you, <coughs> to me it sounded all one tone. So if you slow down, um, you may get more of hints as to when to emphasize or when to maybe drop your voice. Yeah. Also when you drop your voice, Yeah. Will you try, <laughs> try it again? Okay. Getting ready? Cooper's dead. And I wish I hadn't picked that day to say that damn dog of all days. And everyone knows that I loved him more than anyone could. But you were screaming and yelling and carrying on. And I couldn't hear myself think. And I guess I wanted to make sure that you guys knew that I loved you more than I loved the dog. So I said, I'm not going to get us killed because of that damn dog. Yeah. yeah. Should I keep going? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to push the baby, and you had to carry him home the whole way. That was hours before that brown stuff started streaming from his nose. And we got there, and I started walking up the stairs, and and he followed me up gasping for breath, and I felt the guilt that I had never had in my life. And when we got to the hospital, they held him in there longer than they needed to, just so that we would know that they had done everything that they could do. And I waited until they said, I'm sorry, to scream. Yeah, good job. <laughs> <laughs> what was your experience the second time? Because for me, the second time was so powerful. And I could hear <coughs> different things that I didn't hear. But I want to hear what you... Um, I just sort of let myself be in the moment instead of worrying about the words. Really. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. yeah, you, you didn't even look at the face. Right, right. No. Yeah. So I'm sure I didn't do all the words right, but I... Yes, you oh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Nice job, Dale. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and really, that's all you need is somebody to tell you how to make it different, and you do it differently, and you discover something new, <coughs> and then you rehearse that. And maybe your friend tells you another way that you might alter it, and you try that. Sometimes I like to lead people to the ridiculous. You know, make fun of your poem. Get up there and just really flying above my childhood home. <laughs> because what happens is you push yourself to extremes, and then you know where that extreme is, and you can draw yourself back from that to where it maybe doesn't seem like a performance, 
but instead, and this is what I felt in that second reading, that you were there at the moment of the actual composition of the poem. And that's what I think is the best performance, is where the pacing and the feeling are as if they're happening for the first time in the, po in the poet's mind. Who's next? Yeah, your name is? Sean. I know you, Sean. Give it up for him. This is totally different than the last three. You stare overboard. A day's, a day's meal once, now a fish's banquet go. The waves carry it away down to the depths below. Montezuma's revenge, some would quip, some cite seasickness too. But I know the truth, cold-blooded revenge from those clams we'd caught that June. <laughs> it stabbed at my insides, lit them fire with those prenatal pearls. Their tongues roiled in the acidity, till each, one, each one's death had been avenged, screaming, you'll rue the day you crossed me. <laughs> so there they go, back to the blue, from which they'd forcibly come. To their brethren down below, oh God, <clears throat> they're not done. <laughs> <laughs> So this is what happens to me before I go on stage. I realize that I'm half untucked and I'm getting on stage like this. You were doing that. Yeah. You know, you well, had this actually, thing happening actually, over yeah. there. Yeah, so <laughs> if I have my feathers together, I try to remember all of that before I get up there. And then I really police myself. So we're going to do what we did a little earlier. All right. <laughs> all right. And oh, by the way, that is the weakest position <laughs> Now, if that's the persona that you're going for, you can do whatever you want, but I don't think so. Okay. All right? All right. Please, give it up for Sean. <laughs> Sean, okay. let your hands just dangle at your sides. Can I my pockets? No. <laughs> no. <Right here>? No. <laughs> It's so uncomfortable. Do you think I'm having a good time? Do you think Sean is? <laughs> no, don't trap your hands. Yeah. You feel like a doofus. I know. Yeah, I that's am. good. <laughs> it's, all the, it's all there, man. Because even though you feel like a doofus, yeah. what's happening is... You read that, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> You're going to feel the gesture in your loose hands, but if your hands are trapped, any of that, the gesture is completely lost. Right. If you have no gesture, it's fine. But you'll feel it if it's there. Right. <laughs> One more time for Sean. You stare overboard. A day's meal once, now a fish's banquet go. The waves carry it away, down to the depths below. Montezuma's revenge, some would quip. Some cite seasickness too. But I know the truth, cold-blooded revenge from those clams we'd caught that June. They'd stabbed at my insides, lit them afire with those prenatal pearls. Their tongues roiled in this, the acidity till each, one had, each death had been avenged, screaming, you'll rue the day you crossed me. So there they go, back to the blue from which they'd forcibly come to join their brethren down below. Oh God, they're not done. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks for coming. It's much better. Really, yeah. And when you got to the word Montezuma's revenge, your voice took on real gravity, which was wonderful. You know, that's the kind of vocal um, variety that we're ideally hoping for. Who's next? Yes, please. Your name is? Lizzie. Lizzie? Did I hear that right? Yeah. Okay. Dancing in the shadow of a brand new dawn, I celebrate survival, transformation, and the human spirit. From the death throes of street corners to the peace of my own living room. From the crack house to the house of a living God, yeah. I used to be dwelling in the place, now I'm a dwelling place. Glory be to God. From being beat down to being loved, from the last to the first, out of my death came a 
brand new birth with songs, dance, music, and praise. I sing, drinking wine out of a brand new vessel. See, I told it on the mountain through the fire next time. Amen. Wrote my way through insanity, hanging out with Mr. Rhythm and Mama Rhyme. I learned to experience respite on the front line. Then this God shall get, then this not shall lose. So the Bible says, and it's still good news, good news, good news. I found my way through the dark, in the dark, to the darkest place I've ever known, the essence of God, and darkness enclosed a living God. Yo, homies, check this. It's butter, it's butter, it's butter. It's smooth. It's better to be saved hip-hopping with the Lord, for God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The truth is, you can't figure me out. I'm still alive, no doubt. The smoke has cleared, smoke of addiction, abuse, loneliness, and despair. And they asked me right at Christmas if my blackness would have rub off. I said, ask your mama. And the smoke cleared, <laughs> yes, I caught a blaze, but didn't even get scorched. I wore the mask, but lived long enough to take it off. My sisters died aged 32 and 53. If we must die, let it not be like hogs pinned in some inglorious spot. My father died in the Big Apple Motel pinned. I live to celebrate. Not according to your standards. I live to celebrate. No longer according to anybody's standards. With songs, dance, music, and praise, I sing. Ain't no stopping me now. And where I end up, I can win. As long as I keep my head to the sky. And so I celebrate survival, transformation, and the human spirit. As I rise, I rise, I rise. I believe I can fly. So I celebrate me, Lizzie, Fulton and Wilhelmina's baby daughter, as I rise. Yeah. You see what a brilliant teacher I am? <laughs> Thank you, Lizzie. That was great. Has anybody got anything to tell Lizzie to make it better? <laughs> More of it. More of it, yeah. There was, uh, you know, toward the end, you took on a little bit of a British accent. Did I hear that? <laughs> you know? Uh huh. T.S. Eliot coming. It's a weird Blake of Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> Who's next? Oh, who wants to you are, Ann. Okay. Give it up for Ann, please. Yeah. This is an older poem, but I've not read it in public before. Screaming crazy lady came to my house last night and kindly made the children go to bed. Um, thank you, I began, and with a snap of her gum, it was nothing, you were tired, Toots, she said. We look so much alike, the kids confuse us. And in the morning, with sad looks, they leave for school unsettled. I wish you'd be more gentle, I tell her, hugging at her sleeve. I know the children need their sleep, but screaming, I feel so guilty when you do that, please. Just part of the service, she assured me, and swirled on out the door with graceful ease. Yeah. Nice. Now, I'm a little hard of hearing, so I didn't get everything. Um, I want you to project it just a little bit louder, okay? Screaming crazy lady came to my house last night and kindly made the children go to bed. Um, thank you, I began, and with a snap of her gum, it was nothing, you were tired, Toots, she said. We look so much alike, the kids confuse us. And in the morning, with sad looks, they leave for school unsettled. I wish you'd be more gentle, I tell her, tugging at her sleeve. I know the children need their sleep, but screaming, I feel so guilty when you do that, please. Just part of the service, she assured me. And swirled on up the door with grace beliefs. Yeah, you are right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
you're so well composed on stage. I mean, you just really are there, which is kind of what I was, you know, I want Nicole to sort of see that. And yet at the same time, there's no law against moving on stage. It's just that it needs to be purposeful. And you're, you know, just plain solid there with your poem. It really works for me. We got time for one more. Who is it? Yes. And your name is? Charlie. I want to hear it for Charlie. Charlie. I'm going to do the exercise where I just talk about the Perhaps it was the clams that day at Ender's picnic in July that upset my stomach. Maybe it was because of the salad that we ate. <laughs> Perhaps it was because it was 105 in the shade. God only knows. Perhaps it was my, my nerves ran amok. Perhaps it was the walrus from Alice in Wonderland that was on my mind dancing oysters following me as I sang Mamma Mia. <laughs> Too much. It was all just too much to bear. Perhaps it was the idea of no television, no paper, and limited access to social media that it made me so ill. I'm, be I'm beginning to know. Maybe it was the claustrophobic showers of which Mandy speaks. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps it's the idea of losing Shannon in my residencies that has me so upset. Yes, that's it. God, what the hell do I do now? Yeah, good job, Charlie. Perhaps it was the idea of losing Shannon. You know, right there you had the kind of vocal variety within the poem that I'm always looking for. Um, you know, I, ju I just felt it right here. And I'm wondering whether there's another place in that poem where you would also put that out. You know, just the idea of that vocal shift and the sense of the sincerity of the statement really came through to me. I don't know whether it's just me or whether others felt that too. I see Anne nodding her head. So, Thank you so much.